As we literally walk into the newness of 2023, our feet will take us forward into all that God has planned for us. As we move forward, it might seem hard at times to recognize that progress is actually happening. We all have seasons of learning and relearning. So it was for Israel. Wandering in the desert in exile for many, many years. And so we too have seasons where, where we experience spiritual desert. And it might feel endless sometimes. It might feel weary and it might feel lonely. As we approach today's scripture from Isaiah 35, we, we may feel this longing and waiting and we may be hoping for relief and for rest and community. I believe this prophetic text is still speaking today. Before we dive into the scripture, let me give a little background. The prophet Isaiah wrote to a community captured in war. In this case, it was the Assyrians, and later it would be the Babylonians. They were displaced from their homeland. They were enslaved in a foreign land. And it's into this tension that Isaiah eventually disrupts their gloomy circumstances with a hopeful message. As you trust in the Lord, things will turn around for your deliverance. So to understand the picture, we actually have to back up a chapter to the previous, chapter 34, and there we see that the result of trusting the nations of the earth with all their supposed strength and acclaim is that the world becomes a desert place. The effect of these two chapters together is that Isaiah is presenting God's people with a choice. Trust God to secure your freedom, or if you continue to trust in the nations, that's going to lead to more dead-end consequences. So fortunately, God is faithful enough, loving enough, and powerful enough to save his people, as he will do much, much later in the person and work of Jesus, our Messiah. Church, the Lord put this message of hope on my heart this morning for you, and I'm really excited to preach from Isaiah 35 to you this morning. Before we continue, I'd like to commit our time to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray that you would open up our hearts to receive the water that you want to provide for us in the dry places in our hearts and lives. Holy Spirit, so much of the life you've provided us, just like a seed, may remain hidden for a season, but you are the God who brings new things to life, even in the midst of times when we cannot fully see the flourishing that will emerge. Jesus, I pray that you would reveal your messianic gift of joy and redemption, even from the places of our present struggle. Lord, help me to preach this text and please open our hearts to receive your message of hope. In the name of Jesus, amen. Who doesn't like a good turnaround story? For the Philadelphia Phillies, the first half of 2022 was not looking promising for getting to the World Series. The wins were not greater than the losses, but after manager Joe Girardi was replaced with Rob Thompson, things started to turn around. Instead of having a team change the batting order every game like Girardi did, Thompson kept things consistent to keep the guys comfortable and mentally prepared for the game. This new game consistency helped so much that they actually made it to the championship. And this was the first World Series in 14 years. I know they didn't beat the Houston Astros, but it was still quite a turnaround season for the Phillies. When an underdog comes out from their losses in triumph, we celebrate in victory. We really want to see the tables turn and... We want to see our hero overcome the odds. I have good news. The prophet Isaiah prophesies a turnaround victory for God's people. If you're taking notes, today's message is called Unexpected Flourishing. But guys, if you could put the first slide up, that'd be great. The first point is the Lord's redemption replaces your deserts with blossoms. And just a quick reference here. Redemption in this context is actually God's holistic salvation and deliverance of his people. The Lord pays the price to save his people. This is verse one. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it shall blossom abundantly. 
and rejoice with joy and singing. The prophet poetically contrasts the dry, weary place with a hopeful image. It's as if the camera zooms in on one very unexpected sign of life. In the middle of such a barren land, the prophet shows us life where we didn't expect it. In a desert place, we expect to thirst. In a wilderness, we expect to feel alone. In a land of burning sand, we don't expect to feel refreshed. When we're surrounded by the thirsty ground, we don't expect to find relief. But all of a sudden, in a barren land, we see this, the beauty of an abundantly blossoming crocus. Guys, you can go ahead and put that second slide up. This is what a crocus looks like. Are you guys seeing that? In the desert. Seeing signs of life where we don't expect it, we may begin to hope that there is even more life ahead. Maybe at the beginning of this new year, you're longing for a sign of life and a reason to hope. May God bring you hope through the scripture today. But why does Isaiah paint such a stark contrast in the landscape? A desert flower coming to bloom just provides a brief glimpse of colorful life. In the midst of barren places, it's a sign of more life to come. The life that arrives in this desolate scene signals something more as the prophet poetically describes As we read on, we'll see how Isaiah connects this image to God's promise to save Israel from their captivity. In fact, this beautiful bloom seems to announce something of the glory and majesty of our God. We read this in verse 2. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Now, Isaiah brings in another image of a very fertile, beautiful land, Lebanon, and yet another, the majestic mountains of Carmel and Sharon. And in effect, he says, these are glorious, and God's own glory and majesty are on display. God's presence and power are there. When God comes into the desert land, it begins to flourish like a garden with joyful singing. Friends, as we put our trust in God, the Lord's redemption replaces our deserts with blossoms. Amen? I like to share a story from our family. Um, We had a surprise flourishing in our house this past summer in our garden. For years, my wife Rebecca worked hard to grow a veggie garden in our backyard. Now, you need to understand our yard is not very big. For, For a long time, we couldn't figure out why all the fertilizer, The good topsoil and even the raised garden beds did nothing to grow a good veggie crop. Seriously, we tried so many things. Rototiller, manure, organic soil, nothing worked. And y'all know this stuff is not cheap. After this had gone on for year after year, we continued to try, but we only got the smallest of crops. We put good things into the soil, but... The soil remained like clay, and it did not produce the vegetables that we had wanted to eat. Until one day, something in our yard began to change, and we discovered the bigger reason why our gardening efforts were not working. In our yard, we have but one tree, and it's a maple tree. So this very large maple tree was literally sucking the life out of our soil all around the yard. And fast forward many years later, the tree got diseased, and all the branches became brittle and dark. This robust tree quickly perished. After the tree was removed, the next season we tried planting a garden once more, and the results were literally off the charts. We had so many veggies we couldn't eat them all. We had to share the surplus with our neighbors and family, which was a joy to do, especially after not having vegetables for that long. What was once a dead veggie garden was literally transformed into abundance of beautiful produce. Now, returning back to the scriptural image, we see a desert being transformed into a garden. And why is the desert singing? Isaiah pers- personifies the desert land for a reason. Is it just the land that's being revived? Or is there a fuller restoration in mind? What we see here is that God's glory is on display to bring new life 
in unexpected places. Amen? To bring new life and unexpected flourishing. But what about the weary, dry, and discouraged people of God who are exiled in a desert place, a foreign land? As we will continue to see, Isaiah's vision of holistic salvation is of body, of soul, and all of creation. It's hopeful and expansive good news. Looking forward, we can relate these images to a coming deliverer for God's people, a Messiah. Just after Jesus overcomes his temptation in the desert, we read this in Luke 4. Jesus stands up in the synagogue, the Jewish place of worship, and he reads from the prophet Isaiah. He says this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. After he read this, he sat down and said, the scripture you have just heard has been fulfilled this very day. The messianic vision that Isaiah foretold so long before, Jesus fulfills. Isaiah foretells a holistic salvation of body and soul, and it is fulfilled in Jesus' ministry. Friends, right now, as we consider this good news that is proclaimed in a desert place, I invite you to consider what are your desert places? Where are those darkened and dead places where you can't see any signs of life, just like my tree? What are you in need of new life for right now? Is it, is it your marriage? Is it a certain relationship? Perhaps it's your job. Is there a difficult health issue you are struggling with? Friends, the Lord wants to give you hope today that there is a sign of life and a turnaround coming soon. Do you believe it? Maybe this scripture is a sign of life to you today. As we put our trust in God, the Lord's redemption replaces our deserts with blossoms. Amen? Second point is this. The Lord's redemption replaces your weakness with healing. Now, the healing that we read about here is both internal and external. Verse 3 says, Strengthen the weak hands. Make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are of fearful heart, be strong. Do not fear. Here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. As we read these verses, it's clear that the restoration is not just physical. It's also spiritual. God is upgrading his people who have fearful, discouraged hearts with healing and strength. Is this good news to anybody this morning? I don't know about you, but anxiety and, and fear are something I have to deal with every day. The Lord announces here that he will replace God's people's fear and anxiety with strength. This is good news. I hope that I never forget where to come for my strength. I know I need God's strength every day because God is saying here, I have everything that you need. I can relate to the feeling of being weak and having a heavy heart. But the Lord wants to remind us here that he comes near to our human weakness. He cares about our anxieties and our fears to the place where we feel like Maybe we're in captivity ourselves. Our God comes near to bring us deliverance and strength. In the text, Isaiah proclaims a supernatural peace for God's people that will do what? It will make firm the feeble knees. It will bring strength to weak hands. Such a beautiful image. Such provision will help them to not fear 
This phrase, do not fear, is the same thing that God told Joshua before entering into the promised land. The word Joshua means God saves. And spoiler alert, Jesus' name is the same as Joshua. In Hebrew, it's Yeshua. So God saves through Jesus. And what about God's people's suffering and oppression? They probably wondered, when will justice ever come? When will evil be crushed? When will justice prevail? God, where are you? Have you ever wondered that? I have. They probably wondered, when will the Assyrians and later the Babylonians be punished for all the ways that they harmed and enslaved God's people? God's justice will triumph. And in verse 4, we hear about God coming with vengeance against Israel's oppressors. Now, the book of Isaiah, just to zoom back for a minute, has two basic messages, judgment and redemption. Judgment because God's people kept trusting in other nations instead of God. But redemption because God is faithful. He's a faithful promise keeper and he loves his people. And here it's clear that God intends to pay Israel's oppressors back for all the trouble they caused his people. Even though they got themselves into a hot mess. Have you ever gotten yourself into a hot mess? Say yes. (laughs) The Lord is coming to save his people, even to bring them back to their homeland. And when he comes, what will be the further sign of his messianic work? We read this in verses 5 and 6. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped and the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. These verses further unpack how God intends to reverse the calamity of his people. For those who are blind, deaf, Lame and mute, the promise of future healing is announced. So now the landscape of a desert becoming a garden expands to physical and emotional healing. I want to share this story of healing with you. Um, You guys may know Karen Shaw. She's part of our congregation. Um, She's also my mom's best friend, and they've been prayer partners for like 30 years. Um, But in 2013, she was diagnosed with stage 3 lymphoma. And after discovering a lump in her lymph nodes, um, quite unexpectedly, and it was confirmed in her bone marrow, she really had to wrestle with this diagnosis. Now, Karen is a woman of faith. She believes the Lord's promises. When she realized what she was up against with these chemo treatments, Um, she she had to talk to the Lord about what to do next. As she reflected, she thought, I work in a health food store, and it just doesn't make sense for me to put poison in my body to destroy poison. She came home and wrestled before the Lord, and she felt like the Lord was saying, even if you eat deadly poison, it will not harm you. At that time, she believed the Lord was saying that he was going to protect her and to move forward with the treatment. But she continued to wait before the Lord, and before she began any treatment, the Lord spoke these words to her from Isaiah 53, which is also a messianic text. He bore my sicknesses and carried away my diseases. Amen. Now here's the thing that happened right afterwards, and it is remarkable. In Karen's words, I seriously felt like something was lifted up out of my body, and I felt like in the eyes of the Spirit, I saw it being taken away through my ceiling and I just began to thank him and weep all the way through this experience Karen says I felt like a little girl and he took me by the hand and he was walking with me when she met with her doctor to explain her decision to not move forward with the treatment he asked her to return six months later for a pet scan and six months later came and do you know what day it was it was Karen's birthday When they discussed the results afterwards, the doctor said this to Karen. Mrs. Shaw, your intuition was correct. All your test results are clear, and the lump is gone. Amen. 
Karen testified to her doctor that it was God that healed her. And she even shared the gospel with him and later was able to pray for his eyesight. In 2013, she was diagnosed with stage three lymphoma and was not given much hope to live. But God gave her a turnaround. In 2014, God gave her 100% healing from cancer. And in Karen's words, God's promises are settled in heaven. Our God is a healer. Amen? That was an amazing story of healing, right? Lord, we are so grateful that you not only healed in the past and healed in Jesus' ministry, but you're healing today. And I'm also aware that at the same time your kingdom is here, that we're longing for your return. And so we live in this in-between space. It's the already of your kingdom and the not yet. So that means that because we live in this tension, that every time we pray for healing, we don't necessarily see it come. Friends, my own dad died of cancer. Did we pray for his physical healing? Absolutely. I'm quite sure that his life was extended because we prayed for him. But he did eventually go home to be with the Lord. Um, I wished my youngest son could have met him. Um, he did not get to meet him. And that's still a, a grief to me. It's still a sadness that he didn't get to meet him. But I do believe that in heaven, my dad is made whole. In heaven, there's no cancer. In heaven, there's no disease. We know that one day God will restore our bodies, our minds, and all of creation, just as Isaiah prophesied. Towards the end of the Bible, the vision gets expanded even more. We get this hopeful description of the new heaven and the new earth. We read from Revelation, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. This is Revelation 21.4. Until then, we long for the kingdom of God to break into our time and our space, bringing heaven to earth. Amen? After the service, we're going to have a time of ministry, and I pray that some of you would experience today healing and deliverance a release from the heaviness that you may be carrying. I believe that our God is here, present with us today. Now, I also need to point out that what Isaiah is talking about here has spiritual dimensions where when God brings water to the dry places within us, it produces a spiritual vision in place of our blindness, a spiritual sensitivity in place of our deafness. Folks, instead of just limping around in the Lord, we can leap like a deer. Instead of having a wordless testimony. We can release songs of joy. We need the reversals and turnarounds being prophesied here. As we put our trust in God, the Lord's redemption replaces our weakness with healing. Isaiah's vision of holistic salvation of body and soul, again, it's fulfilled in Jesus' ministry. In the Gospel of Matthew, John the Baptist even questions and wanders from prison. Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus replied to John's disciples, go and tell John. Go and tell John what you hear and what you see. This is the testimony. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the poor have the good news brought to them. Go and tell him what you hear and what you see. As we hear about the promise of healing and salvation, do we believe it for ourselves? Even John seemed to question 
and doubt from his prison cell. But Jesus showed him what the promise fulfilled looks like. He showed him what it sounds like through the healing and salvation he provided. Again, what are the areas in your life where you feel weak? Where do you need healing? Where do you need strengthening? Where do you need spiritual vision or discernment at the beginning of this new year? We could all use some more guidance from the Lord, right? What about physical or emotional healing? Perhaps there are areas in your parenting that need some strengthening. I know there are areas in my parenting that need strengthening. The Lord wants to give us upgrades and healings. The Lord desires to bring us this strength. The Lord desires to bring us this healing. Friends, do we believe it for ourselves? As we put our trust in God, the Lord's redemption replaces our weakness with healing. And the third and final point is this. The Lord's redemption replaces our sorrow with singing. We read this from verse Verses 8 through 10. A highway shall be there, and it shall be called the holy way. The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. No traveler, not even fools, shall go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come up on it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there, and the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Friends, as we come to the end of this chapter, we've seen Isaiah's stark image contrast of a desert becoming a garden. And now we see the Lord providing a way home from exile for his people. It says even the fool will not lose their way and wild animals will not be able to harm them. God is making it easy to get home. He's putting a highway in a, in a desert place. But there's more. The curse is going to be lifted, the imprisonment broken. And in that image, we see creation being restored, God's people receiving peace, and a new highway becoming a blossoming, flourishing land. This highway leads back to God. It's the way of holiness. Walking it means following God's safe way, through obedience and purity. And when God's people enter into the holy city, the result is the removal of sorrow and the removal of sadness. Instead of coming home being gloomy, they are coming home with songs of joy. And what is significant about God restoring Israel's song? Right? Just think about that for a minute. If you were enslaved in a foreign land, would it be easy for you to forget who you were, to forget your identity, how you are the beloved chosen ones that they were? God is restoring their song. Hearing the joyful sound, we hear the freedom of God's deliverance. It's their unique voice. It's their unique testimony being restored, from being mute to being unashamed and singing a joyful song. And so it is for us. When we offer God our trust and obedience, he transforms our detours. He transforms our sorrows. He brings our sadness. He, he takes our sadness and turns it into a deliverance song. And then it becomes all about praising. We can praise him when we see blossoms and goodness and fruit coming during 
or even after a dark, dry season. Amen? Can you guys go ahead and put that third slide up for me? My friend Laura uh, shared this picture with me, depicts a very similar scene. It's a beautiful transformation from a dry, arid place to a flourishing land. Guys, it literally has a river running through a desert, trees growing up out of it like you would find in a lush forest. This is some of what Isaiah has been describing in this chapter. Isn't God good that he would provide such a turnaround transformation for his people? Maybe as you hear this, you can relate it to yourself. Are there things in your life that you're longing for in the Lord? Like that desert blossom, it was a sign of hope and life and rescue to come. Friends, what are you longing for today? If this image of desert feels similar to the dry and weary place you find yourself in, maybe this scripture is a sign of life to you today. Perhaps this is the fruitfulness and flourishing that God wants to give to you. And maybe before you got here, and maybe even now, you're like, well, that's just outside of my expectation. That's just outside of my view. That's okay. When you see this desert blossom, I hope you'll be reminded that God is faithful to keep his promises to Israel, and God is faithful to keep his promises to you. Can I remind you to praise him even in the midst of a difficult season, and then certainly afterwards. Let me tell you something else about praise. Praise is a weapon. Praise is a weapon against the enemy. It's a, it's a weapon against discouragement. It's a weapon against doubt. It's a weapon against negativity. In Jesus' name, you can manifest a thankful heart, and it will shift the atmosphere if we allow him, the Lord will replace our sorrow with singing. And people around you need you to manifest your thankful heart because they're experiencing that negativity too. What is your testimony? I can certainly relate to the pain that they must have felt, the disconnection that God's people must have felt in that desert place. When setbacks come and my heart has strayed from my first love, just like Israel, I have felt unable to imagine the songs that would be birthed from my heart to God. But they do come and God continues to pour out his forgiveness and love on my heart as he does for us. And then I respond with my own songs of love and gratitude. Perhaps you feel a similar moment coming near for you. Friends, I don't know what you need in terms of freedom and healing or what dreams you feel may have been delayed while you've been in a desert place. <laughs> but the more we get insight into God's heart for our future, the more we can see the kindness of God as he works to prepare good things for us to walk in that are unique and specific to how he has made each of us. Amen? At the beginning of this new year, Let's consider the road ahead and remember the desert land that God has brought us through and is still bringing us through. God keeps his promises in our life, wherever we are. And our God is worthy of our trust. Friends, I'm so thankful that the Lord's redemption replaces our deserts with blossoms, bringing us signs of life, that a turnaround deliverance is coming. It's coming soon. I'm so thankful that he takes our anxiety and weaknesses and he replaces them with strength and he replaces them with healing. I'm so thankful that for all our sorrow, Jesus gives us songs of joy. I'm so thankful that Christ triumphed over his desert temptation. Where Israel failed, Christ prevailed, amen? He lived a life where he became the healing where he became the compassion, where he became the love that we all need. I'm so thankful that even in his death and in the grave, the grave didn't have the final word. We remember three days later 
the resurrection flowers that bloomed in all of their glory. Even in Jesus' suffering and weakness, even as he shed his blood, even as he purchased our healing and strength, we get to see our deserts transformed into a garden. On Friday night, the world wept in sorrow. But on Sunday morning, all of creation sang out in joy. Friends, if you don't know Jesus this morning, I pray that today you would meet him, That's, that you would receive God's holistic salvation. Holistic because it's for your body, it's for your mind, it's for your soul. It's all of that. If you're longing to experience more of his redemptive power, to replace your weakness with healing, to see that sorrow flee away, for any of those things or for anything else that God may have been speaking to you during this service, I invite you to come up afterwards. We have a prayer team that would love to minister to you. And I'll also be down there. So, friends, it's been a pleasure to preach this text to you this morning. Let me just pray for us as we wrap up. <clears throat> Lord, you have been so kind to bring this beautiful picture of hope to us at the beginning of this new year. You are the one who redeems us. You are the one who replaces our deserts with blossoming flowers. You take our weakness and you transform it into healing. You take our heaviness. You take our heavy yoke, God, and you break it and you give us songs of joy. Lord, we pray that you would help us like Israel to put our full confidence in you for our restoration, for our healing and salvation. Lord, we pray that in the days and years to come that we would have stories of healing from our own life to share, to tell each other how we've discovered unexpected flourishing in places where it literally made no sense except for the fact that you are Emmanuel. You are here with us right now. We would have stories of you taking our weakness and like only you can, transforming it into strength. Taking our sorrow and like only you can, giving us joy. In the name of our Messiah, 